Welcome to this Pearl of Laboratory Medicine brought to you by AACC and the Clinical Chemistry Trainee Council. View this and many more pearls as well as other free educational material at traineecouncil.org. Hello, my name is Anna Scott. I'm a Biochemical Genetics Laboratory Director at Seattle Children's Hospital. Welcome to this Pearl of Laboratory Medicine on Biotinidase Deficiency. For today's pearl, I will start with background information about biotinidase, including its role in metabolism and clinical features. Then we will discuss different clinical assays that can detect and diagnose the enzyme deficiency. Finally, I will touch on biotinidase as it relates to newborn screening. Biotinidase deficiency is an inborn error of metabolism, specifically affecting biotin metabolism. Biotin is also known as vitamin B7. Most free biotin is absorbed through the gut from food. This vitamin is an essential cofactor for four carboxylase enzymes. Biotin metabolism primarily consists of two steps. One, loading the free biotin into an apocarboxylase to form the active form of the enzyme called holocarboxylases. And two, recycling biocytin back to lysine and free biotin after protein degradation. The enzyme responsible for loading free biotin into new enzymes is holocarboxylase synthetase. Loss of function of this enzyme can cause clinical features similar to biotinidase deficiency, typically with an earlier age of onset and greater severity. Biotinidase deficiency results in failure to recycle biocytin back to free biotin for reincorporation into a new apoenzyme. Classical clinical symptoms associated with biotinidase deficiency include alopecia, eczema, hearing and or vision loss, and acidosis. During acute illness, hyperaminemia, seizures, and coma can also manifest. Symptoms in an untreated patient typically appear between two and five months of age. Adult onset cases have been described with varying combinations of symptoms. There are also reports of asymptomatic adults with profound enzyme deficiency who were only identified because newborn screening detected low activity in their children. Typically, treatment entails a daily dose of oral biotin in the range of 5 to 20 milligrams per day. Often 10 milligrams per day is sufficient. Therapy must be the free biotin form, and early implementation can prevent all clinical symptoms. If a patient is diagnosed later in life, after the onset of hearing and vision loss, these symptoms typically do not improve with biotin therapy, but the progressive sensory loss can be stopped. Biotinidase deficiency is a genetically inherited enzymatic defect that follows autosomal recessive inheritance. The gene is encoded on chromosome 3, so both copies must carry pathogenic alterations to cause disease. The estimated incidence is 1 in 30,000 to 80,000, depending on the population. In the state of Washington, we have approximately 85,000 births per year and typically observe one true positive case per year. Other countries may experience much higher incidence depending on their populations. Brazil and several Middle Eastern countries have reported estimates as high as 1 in 9,000. Classic or profound biotinidase deficiency is defined as having less than 10% of mean normal serum activity. Partial biotinidase deficiency is defined as enzyme activity between 10 and 30% of mean normal. Some patients who fall within this range develop symptoms while others remain asymptomatic. There is ongoing debate among physicians who treat these patients about the importance or need for long-term care and oral biotin therapy for partial enzyme deficiencies. We can't have a biochemistry talk without a couple of chemical pathways. As I mentioned in the introduction, biotin is a cofactor for four enzymes essential for three different areas of basic metabolism, amino acid catabolism, lipid metabolism, and gluconeogenesis. Poor function of these carboxylases leads to biochemical abnormalities that can be detected in blood and urine. With an amino acid catabolism, the enzyme 3 methylcrotonyl coa carboxylase is responsible for converting 3 methylcrotonyl coa to 3 methylglutaconyl coa as part of leucine breakdown. Propenyl coa carboxylase is part of both amino acid and lipid metabolism by converting propenyl coa into methylmalonyl coa and finally succinic acid to feed the citric acid cycle. 
Pyruvate carboxylase is also part of lipid metabolism and converts pyruvate into oxaloacetate, again feeding carbon units into the citric acid cycle. The final carboxylase is acetyl-CoA carboxylase that is part of gluconeogenesis and reacts with acetyl-CoA to form malonyl-CoA, ultimately leading to glucose synthesis. Defects in these enzymes can manifest as abnormal biochemistry with accumulation of organic acids causing acidosis and hyperaminemia. Testing for biotinidase deficiency is considered high-complexity testing and typically goes to biochemical genetics laboratories. All of the tests that can be used to detect abnormalities associated with biotinidase deficiency are considered laboratory-developed tests, LDTs. The most diagnostic assay is measuring biotinidase activity in plasma. An abnormal enzyme result typically leads to DNA sequencing for confirmation. DNA analysis can be helpful for partially reduced activities, particularly if there is a question about sample handling. There is a common variant where an aspartic acid is changed to histidine and causes 50% loss of activity for that allele. If we revisit our model pedigree, now one parent carries the common variant, aspartic acid to histidine, and the other carries a classic null mutation. Here, the total measurable enzymatic activity varies with the individual's genotype. Our D444H carrier would have about 75% of normal activity, with full activity from the orange allele and half of normal activity from the red allele. The children would have a mixture of activities ranging from 25 to 100 percent. DNA sequencing can clarify the reduced enzyme activity and provide additional information for counseling the family. For patients not covered by a newborn screening program, presenting symptoms can be nonspecific and lead to a broader metabolic workup. Such evaluation often includes urine organic acid analysis and plasma acylcarnitines. While these are not typically diagnostic for biotinidase deficiency, these results can be suggestive and trigger more specific enzyme analysis. On this slide, the yellow and blue highlights indicate which test would detect each compound. As mentioned earlier, the carboxylases in amino acid catabolism can lead to increased excretion of organic acid intermediates, 3-hydroxy isovaleric acid, 3-methylcrotonyl glycine, propionyl glycine, or 3-hydroxypropionic acid. Plasma acylcarnitine analysis can have increased C5OH. This is 3-hydroxy isovaleryl carnitine. Note the carnitine conjugate is a metabolite included in many newborn screening programs. Significant elevations of C5OH with normal biotinidase activity by newborn screening may be indicative of holocarboxylase deficiency. Biotinidase enzyme activity is the most specific clinical testing for biotinidase deficiency. A UV absorption-based colorimetric assay is the gold standard. Patient plasma is incubated with an artificial substrate linked to 4-amidobenzoic acid. Following incubation at 37 degrees Celsius, biotin is cleaved and 4-amidobenzoic acid undergoes a second reaction with excess nitrite an N1 naphthyl ethylene diamine dihydrochloride to generate a mauve colored product. The amount of product formed can be quantified based on the absorbance at 546 nanometers and a rate calculated from the total incubation time. Absolute values differ between labs and requires local validation of the assay to establish normal and affected ranges. Percentage of mean normal activity may be a more consistent way of comparing results between laboratories. Note, measured enzyme activity in general depends on what tissue the enzyme is expressed in. Many enzymes measured in the biochemical genetics laboratory, such as for storage diseases, require intact cells. Biotinidase is fairly robust and can be readily assayed from serum, plasma, or dried blood spots, facilitating its early incorporation into newborn screening programs. For the newborn screening, a multiplexed fluorescent-based assay was developed and FDA approved. Diagnostic testing methods vary between laboratories, and as of 2019, there is not yet commercial proficiency testing available. Despite the absence of official proficiency testing, there are good practices expected of all laboratories who perform this analysis. An enzyme assay should always include normal and deficient controls, 
as well as patient blanks to test for endogenous interference. In the absence of genuine affected patients, a normal plasma sample can be heat inactivated to create a deficient specimen. Depending on the situation, additional controls may be helpful, such as collecting a second individual at the same time as the patient for shipping and handling control. Measuring the activity of a second enzyme on the same sample can also serve as sample quality assurance. Labs rely on repeat analysis, correlation with DNA results, and or sample exchange with other biochemical genetics labs to establish and maintain testing proficiency. A variety of causes can lead to assay interference, manifesting as either reduced or inappropriately normal results. Some common causes of reduced activity include sample handling, excess heat or humidity, incomplete drying of the blood spot card, repeat freeze-thaw cycles, or delayed sample processing of the plasma. Clinical therapy that can cause artificially increased activity include blood transfusions or treatment with sulfa drugs. The fluorescence-based newborn screening kits are prone to different interferences, including ampicillin, bilirubin, hemoglobin, and glutathione. Secondary biotin deficiency with normal enzyme activity has been reported in individuals who consume excessive amounts of raw eggs. The avidin protein readily binds biotin, as we know from the common use of streptavidin beads in many clinical immunoassays. On a related note, high-dose biotin supplementation can cause interference with many of these bead-based assays. Patients on therapy should inform the laboratory when having other testing performed. The first guidelines for population health screening were proposed by Wilson and Jungner in 1968, and these have served as guidance for a variety of programs around the world. Newborn screening programs in the United States have used this framework to evaluate metabolic disorders for inclusion. Biotinidase deficiency is well described and easily diagnosed by enzyme analysis. Therapy is cheap and effective. Patients typically present between two and five months of age, so diagnosis in the pre-symptomatic period can prevent all clinical symptoms. The screen itself is cheap and easy to perform on a dried blood spot. We have infrastructure to test babies and connect affected individuals with health care resources to manage the disease. Multiple studies have estimated the cost-effectiveness of biotinidase screening and supported screening for this disease. Finally, Americans have supported newborn screening and in recent years advocated for expansion of the program to include even more diseases. For all of these reasons, biotinidase deficiency screening has expanded throughout the world. All 50 states in the United States and more than 30 other countries include biotinidase enzyme activity evaluation as part of neonatal screening to facilitate early diagnosis and therapeutic intervention. Here are the three main points that I hope you take away from this presentation. One, biotinidase deficiency is a systemic enzyme defect that results in a variety of clinical features. Two, the disease is completely treatable with oral biotin vitamin B7 supplementation. Three, measuring enzyme activity in plasma is the most rapid and specific means of diagnosing a patient. Thank you for joining me on this Pearl of Laboratory Medicine on Biotinidase Deficiency. For more like this, as well as articles, podcasts, and more, please visit the Trainee Council at traineecouncil.org.